you are listening to the IFH Podcast Network. For more amazing filmmaking and screenwriting podcasts, just go to ifhpodcastnetwork.com. Welcome to Inside the Screenwriter's Mind, episode number 11. No matter what people tell you, words and ideas can change the world. Robin Williams. Have you ever wondered what it's like inside a screenwriter's mind? In this podcast, we explore how successful screenwriters tackle structure, plot, character, dialogue, and the film business. Get ready to go down the rabbit hole of story. Let's travel inside the screenwriter's mind with your guide, Alex Ferrari. Welcome to another episode of Inside the Screenwriter's Mind. I am your guide, Alex Ferrari. Today's show is brought to you by Bulletproof Script Coverage. Now, unlike other script coverage services, Bulletproof Script Coverage actually focuses on the kind of project you are and the goals of the project you are. So we actually break it down by three categories, micro-budget, indie film market, and studio film. There's no reason to get coverage from a reader that's used to reading tentpole movies when your movie's going to be done for $100,000. And we wanted to focus on that at Bulletproof Script Coverage. Our readers have worked with Marvel Studios, CAA, WME, NBC, HBO, Disney, Scott Free, Warner Brothers, The Blacklist, and many, many more. So if you need your screenplay or TV script covered by professional readers, head on over to CoverMyScreenplay.com. And guys, I have a special treat for you. If you are interested in getting a three-part video series on screenwriting and how to write blockbusters in Hollywood today by some Oscar winners, some multi-billion dollar screenwriters. All you got to do is head over to bulletproofscreenwriting.tv forward slash free video series. Now, today on the show, we go inside the mind of Scott Myers. He is the screenwriter behind the classics Canine, Alaska for Disney Studios, and the cult classic teen comedy Trojan War starring Jennifer Love Hewitt. And Scott's also been a star instructor over at the UCLA Extensions Writers Program and has been teaching ever since. This episode was originally aired on the Dave Bullis podcast. So prepare yourself to go inside the mind of screenwriter Scott Myers. My guiding light through most of my life has been Joseph Campbell and that simple little phrase, follow your bliss, find that thing that you are passionate about, that you, that energizes you, that you feel you have a talent for. And uh, creatively, I've just always done that. And one of the things along the way was I discovered teaching while I was writing. I'd go and do these presentations, be invited, and people say, hey, man, you're really good at this. Maybe you should teach. So uh, that started with teaching online through UCLA Extension. And then when we moved to North Carolina, where I was a television producer for a production company there called Trailblazer Studios for eight years, I started teaching one class a semester at UNC Chapel Hill in the Writing for Screen and Stage program, which was great. Um, And then the DePaul University School of Cinematic Arts here in Chicago came to know me. Uh, One of my colleagues now here, Brad Riddell, who's a working screenwriter and had four movies made. He's now uh, an associate uh, professor here at the, at the program and chair of our program, screenwriting program. And uh, he got in touch with me because he knew about my blog. He was a huge fan of the blog. So we started talking and it's very, very exciting things going on at DePaul. Uh, it's a fast growing school with incredible facilities. The school has three sound stages that it rents for the students at the largest studio system, studio facility outside of Los Angeles in North America. It's the same facility where all the Chicago Fire, Chicago Hope, all those shows are are filmed. Empire was filmed there. Lots of movies are filmed there. So the students not only get a chance to actually get hands-on experience making movies like right away, a very DIY spirit here at the school. They have incredible gear, uh, and these sound stages and a three ton grip truck. Um, they are also segue into working for these productions for NBC and whatnot. So that combined with the fact that the faculty here is tremendous. The support from the administration is outstanding. The school is extremely diverse. A lot of schools talk about, well, we want to, you know, we're into inclusion. We want uh, diverse student bodies. Well, DePaul actually has that. I mean, 
my current MFA cohort, the group that's going to be graduating in uh, 2019, that MFA group, is uh, 50% non-white and over 50% women. And it's really exciting to work with people who have diverse backgrounds and to be able to help them find their voice and facilitate their writing process. So circling back to how I got here, it was just uh, one of those things. You put yourself out there, you do something that you are passionate about, and as Campbell says, the universe will open doors where there used to be walls. And DePaul invited me to come here and apply for the position, and I got it. And I moved here two years ago, and I love it. It's just a tremendous place to be and very exciting working with these students. Yeah, it, you know, w- during the um, the application process, did, did, did you know, they ask any sort of like questions about production or anything like that, like how you would handle something? Because, I, I mean, I imagine you, you were kind of – I mean, not just about screenwriting, so I imagine you you kind of have your hands in a, a, a – you wear a lot of hats, is what I'm trying to say. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I wear a lot of hats. And the great thing about the Paul School of Cinematic Arts is that we've got eight, area of, eight areas of concentration. So there's screenwriting, there's directing, there's creative producing, there's uh, all sorts of uh, – a post – there's an animation group that's terrific. Uh, so we – we don't have a silo system. We work together. Students, again, the students are, I had a freshman last year. He was like three, three weeks in. I meet all my students one-on-one in all my classes. I just think that's important to do. And I was saying, well, I hope you take advantage of your time here because it's, it's really amazing that uh, you have all these facilities and resources to uh, go out and make these short films. And he said, I'm already making one. Three weeks in, he's already making one. So there's a lot of communication between the directors and the writers uh, we have meetings every quarter whereby students get together in this big group and they pitch these projects to each other and it's an incredibly cl- collaborative thing. So yes, I'm involved with helping them with the scripting thing, helping them uh, with their edits, uh, helping them with uh, some of the directing choices they're making as I oversee some of their thesis projects and whatnot. You know, I should note that uh, just recently – uh, the DePaul, the, you know, uh, Hollywood Reporter came out with their top 25 film schools, and DePaul's 13 uh, in that list uh, and rising. Uh, clearly, the number one film school in the Midwest. We aspire to be more than that. Uh, and Variety, we made that list of the top film schools. So it's a it's a really exciting place to be, and we're having students go to LA now and achieve some success. So. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I, one of the reasons I enjoyed being uh, here is that I get a chance to wear a lot of hats and work with students in a lot of different ways. So, you know, Scott, you mentioned the, the student that, that, you know, three weeks in, he was already shooting something or planning to shoot something. Do you ever have the opposite? I mean, is there ever a student who shows up and, and just says, you know, uh, you know, maybe they start dragging their feet or they you have to kind of like say, hey, hey aren't you going to make something? Do you ever have that? Uh, yeah, there are students who, you know, and I don't, you know, I don't, uh, uh, denigrate them at all, uh, if they come here and they just want to be writers, you know, or perhaps they just want to work in post, you know, in visual effects, they don't want to go out and, and, and do production, you know, having done some of that, I think I agree pretty much with what William Goldman said when he said, uh, paraphrasing here, he said the first day, uh, the most exciting day of a screenwriter's life is the first day on a set, on a movie set. The most boring day in a screenwriter's life is the second day on the movie set. <laughs> yeah, because it's a lot of setup and just waiting around for things, you know. So I, I found that when I was doing TV producing out in the field and whatnot, it was okay. I didn't really enjoy it that much. I really enjoy more working. So there are students who I, I respect that, but then there are other students who have to be encouraged, you know, they have a creative idea and they've got a good visual sense of acuity and say, okay, come on, just get out there and try it. There's no, there's no downside here. It's not like if you make a short film and it, it stinks, well, you've learned a lot. There's things that you can only learn by being out in the field and, and making movies. You just can't learn it all by sitting in a room writing. And so I encourage people to, um, you know, all my writers that I work with, whether it's through to Paul or through a screenwriting masterclass or interfacing with in my blog or going out to these conferences and festivals I've been going to uh, more frequently now, I encourage them to go make stuff. This is a time right now 
where with everything going on and the second golden age of TV or peak TV, digital filmmaking, where content is king, queen, prince, duke, whatever, and who is responsible for creating that content, for coming up with that stuff at, at the inception stage? It's writers. And so this is a fantastic opportunity for people who are creative and have, have a good way with words and, and know how to write and craft stories to, to do that and then see if they have a directorial chops. That way you can control your material a lot more. So, yeah, I have students that run the gamut. You know, I have students that come in and, you know, many of them have, they can name for you every single shot in a Martin Scorsese movie. You know, I mean, I've had those kind of students. And I have students who come in who their parents, you know, have them majoring in economics or business or whatnot, but they're creative. And so they come in here and they can take a, a double major in, in screenwriting, a BFA or a BA or, or even a minor, you know, and to see them light up and see them really grow uh, creatively. And then maybe it's only an avocation for them moving forward and not a, a vocation. Well, that's great. At least they've discovered something that they're passionate about and they have a talent for and they can do that and, and, uh, and have a richer and fuller life. You know, I, I thought you were going to say the uh, William Goldman uh, quote, nobody knows anything. So. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's true. I mean, oh, we, we're seeing this right now, aren't we, Dave? Like, yeah. you know, up until about a year ago, it was like, oh, rom-coms are dead. Nobody wants to see rom romantic comedies. Rich, Crazy Rich Asians comes out. Boom. Three of them. Greenlit in one week. You know, a spec script singles day, the sequel to Crazy Rich Asians, and a K-pop uh, project set in, Korea, in Korea. So, you know, um, now we're seeing articles about how Crazy Rich Asians has resurrected the rom-com. <laughs> so, so people, when they say these things, you know, they don't understand the cyclical nature of the business. Um, and, and uh, yeah, so I think that's probably true. What, what Goldman says, nobody knows anything. It's kind of like how zombies um, were always, you know, considered played out or what have you. And then The Walking Dead came around, and now suddenly they're, you know, they were cool again. And then, yeah. and then, you know, now, now it's cyclical all over again. Well, I'll tell you another thing because you know, you know me. I track the spec script mark, and I've been tracking it since. Well, I broke in in 1987 by selling a spec uh, canine, and then really started in earnest to track it in 89, 90. So my blog. Go into the story, you can go and see that I've got over 2,000 spec script deals annotated there dating back to 1991. And up through 2014, not one time in the entire period of tracking spec script market during the 20 some odd years of doing that was drama in the top three in terms of genre sales. It was always comedy, action, or thriller. Always. And then for the last three years, the number one genre in the spec script market has been dramas. Again, nobody knows anything. So we're in a new cycle here. And trying to interpret that is quite interesting. I think part of it is that um, people have grown up with reality TV, a whole generation. And so they're used to and interested in, quote unquote, real people. And so in the case of historical dramas, they actually are like real people. I think part of it is nostalgia. Uh, we're awash in nostalgia right now. And so when they see uh, a picture, you know, like a script that was on the top of the blacklist a few years back uh, about Madonna or the, before that about Michael Jackson told from the perspective of his pet monkey bubbles, you know, those type of uh, historical dramas, um, they hit their, they hit on a, you know, the, where the reader or, or the viewer uh, knows them. It's like nostalgic. And I think the final thing really going on there is just the studios are way into uh, pre-branded content. You know, they want content that uh, people will know about. And so historical figures, you know, uh, is a way of doing that because people will know about uh, a figure in the past, you know. So, so yeah, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a fascinating time. We really is just an interesting time right now. And, uh, uh, it's great to be a creator in that type of environment. So, so Scott, like what, what have you read any like unpublished or, um, uh, I'm sorry, unpublished. Have you read any, um, any unproduced screenplays recently that have just like floored you? Yes. 
I just got done doing my 12th blacklist feature writers lab uh, in LA, got back about two weeks ago and there were six projects and all of them were really good. And a couple of them were just, uh, were, you know, one of them was like almost ready to go. I mean, there's some rewriting they could do on it, but you could totally see it. It's a genre piece, elevated genre piece. Um, and so, yes, you know, there's, there's great material out there. Now the spec script market is down this year and as compared to last year and last year was down compared to the previous year. And I think in large part that's due to the studios, um, you know, again, just relying on pre-branded content, franchise material and whatnot. But I still believe this to be true that if you write a great script, it'll find its way. Someone's going to respond to that. And, um, so yeah, there's great material out there. You know, I've got students here written, written scripts that, uh, they'll need to rewrite them, but they got strong concepts, great character execution. So, uh, yeah, if there's still some really good content being made, that's the key. It's just, uh, you know, write a great script. So, so let's talk about that. You know, when, when you're working with, with students, you know, what are some of the advice that you, that you give to, to these college students? Well, the first thing is to remind them constantly that movies are primarily a visual medium. There are some who will tend to rely too much on dialogue to drive the action. Not to say that dialogue's bad. It isn't. But for certain genres, uh, action uh, comedy, depending upon the type of comedy it is, thriller, science fiction, fantasy, those type of movies really lend themselves to visual storytelling. And that's the type of thing that Hollywood does better than anybody else in the world, you know, visual storytelling. Um, and so I, I remind them that, look, for the first three decades of movies' existence, there was no dialogue. It was silent films. Yeah, we had those little inner titles. But largely, it was just visuals. And in some ways, we're circling back to that kind of paradigm, I think. Because now with the box office receipts, the revenues, 70 to 75% of those generated by the international markets, whereas a joke, a line of dialogue, an exchange of dialogue may not translate that well from, say, the United States to China or Brazil or Germany or whatnot, uh, someone slipping on a banana peel and falling on their ass is universally funny. So I, that's the first thing I, I hammer with them, uh, like every quarter is, you know, it's a visual medium. You've got to think visually, you know, whenever you start to construct a scene, that's your starting point is, is a, a visual storytelling. I'd also say this because, you know, I stay on top of the business. It's weird that I'm in you know, I'm more connected now in, in Hollywood than I ever was when I lived two and a half miles east of 20th Century Fox um, because of my blog. Uh, you know, is, is there several things going on relative to cultural trends and technological developments? The generation right now, the young gener young people, uh, you know, up through the millennials, but uh, these 18-year-olds up to that, they have seen, heard, or read exponentially more stories than previous generations. If you consider stories to be Snapchat conversations and text conversations and YouTube videos, that sort of thing. Um, and I, those are stories, you know, uh, the beginning, middle, end, many of them. And so they just intuitively know story on a level that I think previous generations don't. So, for example, they don't need as much exposition now as used to be, which is why I think you've seen this shift. Back in the 80s when I broke in, what is now, what used to be the end of Act One then is now the middle of Act One. You just don't need all that setup. Get into the story and get going. And that's another thing. Because young people nowadays are so used to getting their content when they want it, how they want it, now, 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 that, that another thing I teach my students is get into the story. Drop them in. There's that 
Latin phrase in media race, drop them into the middle. Just put them in there. They want that type of thing. They want to get into the story. They may not even need to know that much about the characters. You think about movies like Ex Machina or Lucy. There's a couple of movies that come to mind. You know barely anything about the protagonist within two to three minutes. Boom, they're into the plot. And so I think young audiences kind of like that. Like, okay, as long as they're not confused, you say, I, I, I'm here with this character and we're into the action. I'm going to find out all that exposition along the way, not sort of lay it out up front like we, we traditionally used to do. So there are definitely some things going on in terms of technology and cultural mindset uh, that um, uh, you know it, it, we need to be cognizant of as screenwriters, and I try to pass that along to my students. So when, when you mentioned that you know the the it used to be in the '80s, the end of Act One is now the middle of Act One. Do you sort of so so let me ask you this, guy. Let me kind of rephrase that my my question. Do you kind of think like you know usually in the hero's journey? With Joseph Campbell, you know, there's a, there's the call to action and then there's the refusal of the call. Don't you think that the refusal of that call sometimes can be a little too – is 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 maybe not needed? And here's what I mean by that. You know, if you go to see like a road trip movie nowadays, you already know they're going on the road trip. So is there really any need to have a refusal of the call? Because, I mean, hell, the, the you know, the, them being on the road is the whole reason that brought you into the theater. Do you know what I mean? Well, that's – you're raising an interesting point, Dave, which is that – the awareness level of people going into movies is such based on trailers and the inundation of uh, marketing. And I think that does have an impact. So if you know that this is a road picture, do you really need to spend 25 pages setting it up? No, you don't. Uh, you know, you're just, you're just going to, you're going to bore the, the, the younger generation. They just, they just want things to, I think, in, in their storytelling to move much more quickly. So in terms of the refusal of the call, well, this gets into a bigger area. And this is another thing that I uh, hammer my students on, which is that you've got to ground your story crafting process in the characters. And so and particularly the protagonist. And so if the question, for, you know, if you were like a student and came in and said, I don't know whether I should have a refusal of the call to adventure uh, with this character or not, you know, I would say, well, don't look at it from outside the story universe, go inside the story universe and get to know that character. Are they the type of individual that would refuse or are they the type of individual who would leap at the opportunity? You really need to ground the storytelling in what I call the protagonist's journey. In fact, I'm uh, working up a book proposal right now. Um, I was approached by a publishing company to, to write a potential textbook um, in which we invert the way we look at, I think, typically, or at least the way that kind of floats around in the screenplay universe about how to approach story structure. So much of the emphasis is on plot and on these page counts and whatnot, which I think is a rather wrongheaded way of approaching it. Much better to go at it by immersing yourself and engage in the story universe and engaging yourself with all the characters, in particular the protagonist. The protagonist's goal, the protagonist's want and need, all that stuff basically uh, sets the, the spine of the story. And so how much better to come to the plot by working with the character and determine and it's their story. <laughs> you know, It's their fate. I call it the narrative imperative. That story that happens to the protagonist, if it happened two weeks ago in their life or a month from now, it would be a different story. It's happening right now. There's a reason why you type fade in at this moment with that story. And there's a reason why that character intersects with other characters, the specific set of characters as they go along. There's a reason why those events happen in Acts 1, 2, and 3, because it's facilitating the protagonist's transformation. That journey Again, this is inverting the, the, the idea. As opposed to looking at the plot first, look at the plot as a way of facilitating, servicing, and supporting the protagonist's transformation. Joseph Campbell said the whole point of the hero's journey is transformation. And so that's another big area that I focus on with my students. We do a ton of work on character development. In fact, I created a class here um, called Story Development, and we spend uh, – it's an entire quarter – 
working with characters and out of that working up an outline. So then you move into writing a first draft. So back to your question, I mean, this thing about whether there's a refusal to call any of that stuff, you have to be mindful of cultural trends and, you know, audiences uh, in terms of their interests and predilections. But yeah, everything needs to be grounded in working with the characters as far as I'm concerned. I mean, character equals plot. And so let's put some flesh on the bones there and actually make that come to fruition. Is it, when you see the students come in or even when you're working online with, with different people, do you see a tendency to, to do that formulaic sort of plot points? Well, there are some books, and you know them, I won't name them, that are, <laughs> that, you know, <laughs> that, that have very specific paradigms. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I just, I have, I have concerns about that. I have concerns about that for multiple levels. If you reduce screenplays to, you know, these specific sort of page count, this needs to happen here and this needs to happen there, you're, it's problematic on several fronts. One, uh, it demeans the craft. It makes it look like we're dealing with widgets as opposed to the creative effort and the creative uh, skill and talent that's required to write a rich story with multidimensional characters, surprising twists and turns, and all the rest. You know, that requires creativity. If you're out there espousing something and you have a software system that you can plug things into and come out with a, you know, paradigm or whatever, then that demeans the craft. And that extends to the experience of professional screenwriters working in Hollywood right now. If you're a studio executive who maybe got an MBA from Stanford or Harvard, and you meet with them and, you, and you, they're giving you script notes and they say, well, I'm sorry, but your act one ends too late. You know, it needs to have, break into act two on 25. Well, if that's all they know about story is that sort of formulaic approach to screenwriting, then – why do we end up with so many formulaic script uh, movies? <laughs> it's because of that type of thinking. So I think that any attempt to codify some sort of so-called rules or uh, these kind of formulas is really working at counter purposes to what it should be, which is a true creative effort. And that, again, lean into the characters, see where they take you, you know, it's exciting to see scripts like A Quiet Place. Did you read the script A Quiet Place? Or, you've seen the movie, right, probably, Dave? Yeah, I've seen the movie. I didn't read the screenplay. Well, you know, it breaks like so many of the so-called rules. I think it's like 68 pages long. They include photographs and images. They mess around with fonts. I've actually interviewed... <clears throat> those guys and they're actually coming to Chicago in the end of September for our courier 12 conference and going to be panelists here, uh, Scott and Brian. And so you read these scripts and see that there are these creative choices being made and the stories work, you know, so they don't fit the, uh, they don't fit the, the sort of formulaic paradigm. So, uh, yeah, I, my, I, unfortunately for me, most of the students I deal with, except for the graduate students who may have had more experience in, you know, immersing themselves in screenwriting, the world of screenwriting and whatnot, most of my students are undergraduate and they haven't been tainted by that, you know, which is great because then I can just deal with them like, you've seen, you know, thousands of movies and TV series and whatnot. Great. You've got an innate understanding of this. Uh, and, and so let's build on that, but let's start with characters. Okay. Let's start with your characters and see where they take you. Yeah. So it, it's, it's kind of like you, you're letting the characters kind of lead the plot uh, rather than having, you know, this sort of template that comes in. I always see those templates like, like training wheels, you know, it's fine to use it if you're doing like a, your first, you know, screenplay or whatever. But if you start, keep doing that, you kind of end up with those formulaic movies that we, that, you know, you and I always talk about. Well, and some of those formulas were created back in the 90s. You know, are they relevant 20 years later? You know, apart from three-act structure, 
and perhaps the idea of sequences, you know, I, I, is there anything really that is kind of sacrosanct in terms of the craft uh, vis-a-vis this, you know, screenplay structure? I don't think so. You know, I, I think that, uh, again, you, yes, have fo- follow the characters. It's their story. They exist. They know it better than you do. They're inviting you to tell the story. They want you to tell the story. So it's much better to have, uh, you know, I, we, we go through these brainstorming exercises. Like I, I take my student through, we do six sets of brainstorming exercises. We spend an entire couple of weeks just doing brainstorming. You know, <laughs> forget uh, any of the, uh, the, 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 the construct construction of the story the first, we just get to know the characters. And so they'll do the traditional indirect engagement exercises like questionnaires and biographies. And I'll have them, you know, write a scene just to kind of with the characters and just to get them loosened up. But then we move into these direct engagement exercises, which are great. It's like, all right, imagine you're a psychiatrist and you're going to uh, have this patient as one of your characters. And they've been court appointed. They have to see you and they have to answer questions. They cannot get out of this unless they answer your questions. And so now you move from dealing with the character as an I-it relationship, like they're over there. You're dealing with them directly as an I-you. And so I'll have them do these exercises where they interview the characters. Then, uh, Then they'll even get a little bit more into that kind of California New Age thing, which is a lot of fun when I'm dealing with some students who are a little bit more left brain oriented. Okay, so I'm going to have you go into a room, close the door, turn off the phone, get a piece of paper and a, and a pad of paper and a pen, or get in your computer, and I want you to do some deep breathing. It's like meditation. I want you to deep breathe in and out for a few, about a minute or so. And I want you to be thinking of that character and get into their headspace. And for the next 10 or 15 minutes, set a timer, I want you to blind type. What are they thinking? What are they feeling? And yes, your mind will go, well, I have to do this and I've got to go wash the dog and whatever. That's just chatter. Let it go. Come back to that character and keep reaching out to them and try and get into their headspace. You can do that as like stream of consciousness. You can also do that as like monologues. Like what are they going to say? And so you just blind type. You do that for 10 or 15 minutes. Now, what you end up with, maybe 80% of it is nonsensical. But 20% of it, uh, whatever percentage, 10, 20, 15, 20, 25, 40% can be gold. You've like accessed that character. Moreover, if it is like a monologue or even just articulating what they're thinking or feeling, you're starting to get a sense of their voice. And so it, it is that weird thing I call writing wrangling magic, you know, where you you're, you're believe in this magical thing where the characters exist in this weird way. And so if you really believe that, then you'll start to see and hear them. It's like the inverse of that seeing is believing. Well, believing is seeing and hearing. You reach out to them. They wouldn't have appeared to you, and they wouldn't want you to write their story if they hadn't shown up. But they did show up somehow in your conscious, subconscious, or conscious life. And so reach out to them. And so we do all this brainstorming. It's great. It's really great. And and I, I, I have to say, I've done, a, and I teach it to Paul in screenwriting master class. I have that prep class I started eight years ago. And I've done that like 30 times. That's the thing that, uh, I mean, apart from everything else that they enjoy, the writers enjoy about that process. When, when we get through that brainstorming, they create this master brainstorming list and they got all this content that they've surfaced, 10, 20 pages of stuff before they even move toward plotting. I get I get compliments about that all the time. Like, oh my God, that was such a mind blowing experience. I can't believe how great that was. How much more in touch I am with the story, you know. And an added benefit when you're in touch with the characters and they're alive, and they're speaking to you, and you're seeing them, and you're hearing them, and you can't get them out of your mind. How much more motivated are you to write the story because you're connected with them? So, yeah, you know, <laughs> I preach character a lot. I'm sorry I get off of my soapbox on that, but uh, I just. It's a counteractive to formulaic writing is just working with characters. And moreover, it's just, I think, the, the right-headed way to do it. Yeah, I, I think it's kind of like it, it gives you like that North Star, that North Star that's kind of like this is where you're going with your story rather than kind of 
making the writing of itself a stream of consciousness. You know what I mean? So it kind of it, it allows them to have a lot more, um, or even just you know anyone doing this in general, it allows you to have a lot more of. Uh, not where to go, but also you, you kind of know, okay, well, these are some different scenarios or situations or what have you that I've, covered, that I've already kind of thought about but before I get into the outlining phase. Oh, yeah. And the brainstorming, I tell them, don't pre-edit. I mean, you may be sitting there typing, right? You're this, uh, this stream of consciousness, and all of a sudden, chocolate milkshake pops to mind. You may think, oh, well, that's just dumb. No, put it down. Imagine what Orson Welles, if he'd been brainstorming and said, snow globe? What's that? Threw it away. You know, no, became an essential part of Citizen Kane. So you'll have scenes appear. You'll have lines of dialogue appear. You'll have moments appear. You'll have characters pop up. You may be working on the protagonist character and all of a sudden the nemesis pops up. Okay, go off and work with the nemesis. They evidently want to talk to you right now. Um, Now, that said, you can, if you're working with the protagonist, I think, you talk about a North Star, the protagonist is your North Star. In most stories, um, the protagonist's journey is what dictates like virtually everything. It's why those char- other characters exist. If you think about, for example, uh, Ron, uh, not Ron Bass, uh, Robert Town had that great question. He said, one of the best ways to understand a character is to ask, what are they most afraid of? Okay, well, let's run with that. So what if you work with a protagonist and you come up with an answer to that? What are they most afraid of, right? Clarice Starling in The Silence of the Lambs, most afraid of confessing that horrible experience she had in the Montana farm where she saw the, witnessed the spring slaughter of the lambs. She grabbed a lamb and ran off with it. She was trying to save that lamb, but it, it was so heavy. It was so heavy, she says. Well, if you really drill down into the psychology of that story, she is, that lamb represents her father. She's trying to save her father. Her father was slain when she was like 10 years old. And so what she's most afraid of is the boogeyman who killed her dad. The random chance he opens a door, these guys are stealing a TV, boom, boom, they shoot him and he dies. So, so if she's afraid of facing those the, the 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 associations that she has with her father's death and those bad guys, you know, with that experience in the Montana farm. Well, so what better way to create drama than to have her face a boogeyman at the end, who is Buffalo Bill? So now all of a sudden you've got a specific psychological connection between your protagonist and your nemesis. It's not just generic. That that nemesis is a projection or physicalization of the of the protagonist's shadow uh, using Jung's language. And so, okay, that's cool. Well, then you think, all right, well, so what about allies along the way? Well, you'll meet like a mentor figure or two, you know? Well, in case of Clarice Starling, that's just the great, you know, it's just, that, that movie is like the perfect thing for me to teach because it's like, fits everything that, hits everything that I, I, I kind of believe about storytelling. Mentor character's Hannibal Lecter. Perfect guy for her. Not only because he's tied to the Buffalo Bill case, but also because he's a shrink. And so he's, he can absolutely guide her into herself, which is what she needs to do. If you look at the story, The Silence of the Lambs, from a meta standpoint, you know, what is the narrative imperative? Why does Clarice get called to, into this story? It's, yeah, it's to solve the case and to save Catherine Martin. But on a personal level, on a, her psychological journey, it's to intersect with Hannibal Lecter and they do that quid pro quo. You tell me, uh, I, I'll tell you things. You tell me things, Clarice, but not but personal things, right? <laughs> so, uh, you know, she Crawford says, don't let him inside your head. Boom, she lets him inside her head. And so the mentor helps her go all the way down and tell that thing that she doesn't want to confess, which is the story of the Montana Farm. So the, if you work with the protagonist and you start thinking in terms of their journey, you can even, by asking the question, my language system, what's their opening state of disunity? What, what are they disconnected from in their, in their psyche? Their stuff they're repressing, their, their core of being, their, their need. There's, when we talk about need, not need to obtain something, but need to emerge. What needs to emerge from inside, right? Glinda the Goodwitch says to Dorothy, Dorothy, you've had the power to go home all along. It's already there. 
Ovid says the seeds of change lie within. And so the character, the protagonist has that stuff inside and it needs to emerge. So they're in a state of disunity. They're disconnected from that. But if you can identify what it is that needs to come out, that suggests the end point, unity, positive transformation. Obviously, there are stories where the protagonist doesn't have a positive transformation. So just by working with the protagonist character and looking at their, their psychological state to depth, you can surface all sorts of things. And of course, brainstorming will help surface the subconscious stuff that, uh, you know, can really enrich a story. Again, getting off on a soapbox there, Dave, but I'm passionate about this stuff. You know, I want people to write stories that are vibrant and alive and, you know, not formulaic, the, the, the plot emerges from working with the characters. You know, that, that's my true passion. Yeah, it's just like this interview. Like I, I'm Clarice, uh, Clarice, and you're you're kind of like Hannibal Lecter. So I've come, I've come to ask you for for, for help. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I I, I it's funny. I did the London Screenwriting Festival last year, Screenwriters Festival, and they invited me back. I'm going again in a, in a week, and uh, I'll be doing a master class and four presentations. But I, I, I talk about uh, one of the presentations I did last year, and they asked me to reprise it this year. Is writing a worthy nemesis. And my, th- my thesis there is that the best way to come up with a worthy nemesis is to start with the protagonist. Again, what, what is inside them? If you ask the question, what do they fear the most, and then put the protagonist in the situation where they have to confront that fear, that's just great drama. So, uh, but yeah, I think the point is that I do a little Hannibal Lecter interp- uh, impersonation <laughs> when I do that. And uh, I, I, some people really liked that last year. So I guess I'll try and try and do that again this year. So. It's something that somebody once pointed out to me. Now I can't unhear it. It was, um, I, I ate his liver with farber, farber beans, and a, beans. Bottle, uh, uh, and a bottle of key. Ki, ki, Chianti. Ki, yeah. And somebody said it's actually key. Ki, Chianti or something like, apparently he mispronounced it in the movie and I didn't even notice it. And I'm like, now, now whenever I hear him, I'm kind of like, Oh, uh, uh, you know, well, he it, says it, but he, I, I think he's being ironic. I mean, I think he purposefully mis- mispronounces it because you listen to it, it's hang there. He goes, it's, with some fava beans and a nice Chianti, like he's from New York or something, you know. <laughs> uh, but, uh, yeah, I think he does kind of mispronounce it or whatever. But, <laughs> but you know, I'm going to have to watch, rewatch the movie and, uh, and pay attention to that part again. But, yeah. uh, but you know, I wanted to, you know, Scott, I know we're kind of uh, pushed on time, but I, I sure. wanted to talk about Zero Drift 30. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, you know, it, it's uh, – you know, I wanted to interview you again before it started, and it's actually starting in what two days? Um, September first, yeah, yeah. So two days. So, uh, you know, could you just you know take us through you know the the impetus for you to start Zero Draft Thirty and, and what it is for those okay. who don't know? Sure. Well, uh, back in, in October of 2015, I'd been working on a script project and developing it, and it started writing it when something happened in the news that basically blew up the story. And so, you know, I've had situations where projects uh, had gotten kind of pulled out from underneath me but this was particularly vexing because i put a lot of time into it and so i was very frustrated well i had this comedy that i'd been sitting in my back burner for some time so i just said on my blog all right i haven't even worked the story out i i know the characters i know kind of where i want to go but starting november 1st through november 30th i'm just going to write this script and it's like NaNoWriteMo. I mean, it's not like an original idea. They used to do a thing called Script Frenzy, but they stopped doing it, I think, in 2013. So I just invited people to, to do it with me. Well, it got picked up by IndieWire. It was translated uh, into, like, Spanish and other languages. And I think we had over 1,000, as far as I could tell, sort of guesstimate people doing that. And we had dozens and dozens and dozens of people who finished the script. Somebody came up with this idea of I called it zero drafts, and then they came up with the idea of zero draft 30, like zero dark 30, only zero draft 30. And so that became the, the moniker for it. The basic idea of zero draft is it's like a pre-first draft. So if you have problems with perfectionism and you have problems with procrastination, and procrastination largely is about, well, I'm afraid that what I'm going to produce is not going to be any good. So that's perfectionism. Well, this is a great way. It's like a blast at that because – it's all about productivity rather than, uh, you know, the quality. It's about quantity pages, not quality pages. Obviously, write them as best you can. But the point is to get from fade in to fade out with the belief that by having done that, you will have learned a lot more about your story. 
than when you began it, even if you've outlined your story and you'll have crossed that psychological barrier, which you've gotten to the first draft. And so now you can have something to work with as opposed to just staring at a blank page. So what happened was uh, we did that. And then my theory is, and I always tell people that if you're outside the business and you want to break in, you need to be obviously watching movies and reading scripts, but also writing pages. And so write two specs a year. Even if you did one page a day, you spent a month prepping a story, you wrote for four months a page a day, that's 120 pages, and then you spent a, a month rewriting it. Well, you could do two spec scripts a year just by writing one page a day. So I, what I did was on the blog, we decided to do two Zero Draft 30 challenges a year, one in September and one in March. March is actually 31 days, so you get a bonus, bonus day. And so they're basically you know, spaced six months apart. And there's a Facebook group, Zero Draft 30 Facebook group, which is a public group, but it's private in the sense that you have to join it. We now have 3,100 members. That's an ongoing thing. Uh, you know, it's a terrific group. It's very much like going to the story. It's everybody in there, you know, is, understands that it's a real hard road to hoe, that the uh, competition is fierce, that success is hard to come by. But we're also optimistic. We're also, we, we lift each other up. You know, I can always just point to myself, say, look, I was completely outside the business. I knew one person and I wrote my third spec script and sold. So, you know, I can't deny that reality. It does happen, even though the odds are long. So the Zero Draft 30 challenge starts on September 1st, ends on September 30th. I do a blog post every day with some inspirational stuff. We, uh, I look, you know, there's a hashtag ZD30 script. I look there, I look at the Facebook group, I look at my blog, I see what people are posting. Every day I'll select somebody and give them an award. It'll, it varies, sometimes it's the Anita Luce Award, who was uh, one of the first great screenwriters in Hollywood, a woman. Uh, and sometimes it's a Dalton Trumbo Award. And so they just get a little picture with their name you know, on it and just a little something to motivate people. But it's great. We also, this year, have uh, a, a harmonic convergence I, for reasons which I, I I can't get into, it's just too long, but the spirit animal for the Zero Draft 30 group is a hamster uh, called Scamper. We don't go writing sprints. We do writing scampers. Again, it's like have some fun with this, right? So we do this thing. We've now done it, I think, like 30 times every first Friday night or Saturday, you know, 12.01 a.m. to Sunday, 24-hour period. We do what we call a writing scamper a So there are 24 hosts around the world each hour of the day so that you know you just pick a day, uh, pick, an, uh, pick a, a time slot, you're going to know that somebody's going to be there to usher you into your hour and, and congratulate you on spending that hour writing. The point of it is to get people to write on weekends. And the point of that is to get people to write every day. You know, If you get writing every day, then it becomes a habit and you're more productive. So it just so happens that this September challenge, starting September 1st at 12.01 a.m., I'm going to launch the next 24-hour scamper a thought. So if people are interested, they can go to the Zero Draft 30 Facebook group. Uh, just look that up. Uh, again, it's a tremendous group of people there. We've got some wonderful moderators who oversee things. And there's no – we don't allow anybody to promote any consulting services or any contests or any of that stuff. It's like a completely ad-free, pressure-free zone. It's just people who – uh, you know, want to support each other and help each other. And, and uh, um, you know, writers groups form off that, that, you know, private writers groups or people will say, uh, I have some pages, I, I, I'll read pages in exchange for you reading pages, you can do that offline. Um, so, uh, but anyhow, that's zero draft 30. It's a, the, the zero draft approach. There are there are professional writers who, who do this. There's a F. Scott Fraser, five or six years ago, got on Twitter one day and said, I'm going to write a draft in 24 hours. And he and he he commented along the way, uh, in uh, in, in uh, on Twitter, and he did. He wrote that draft in 24 hours. It was a real rough draft, like 60 pages, but that became a movie. <laughs> he wrote the script and sold it, and it became a movie. So there's real value in the zero draft approach, and particularly if you're a perfectionist and you you, you tend to procrastinate. Do you know what that movie was called? That that he. Uh, I, I, I can look it up. Um, I, I, he's, he's been off Twitter for quite some time, but it was, uh, uh, I'll have to look it up. I'll, I can email it to you. Okay. 
Yeah, yeah, I just that, that, that's actually pretty interesting, Scott. Yeah. Um, but uh, but yeah, you know, I, I'm actually going to compete in uh, well, compete. I'm actually going to participate. Yeah. In uh, Zero Draft Thirty, because uh, you really don't compete against anybody but yourself. But but <laughs> but uh, you know, uh, yeah, I, I want to participate this year. Uh, I I tried to do it last year, and I just kind of fell off the wagon. I guess I don't. I just kind of it kind of fell off the rails, and uh, so I, I'm going to participate this year. I uh, I got that handy dandy calendar out, right. and I was like, so yeah, I, I, that thing's awesome. Yep. So uh, whoever made that, uh, you know, great, that's great work. And Stephen Dudley did that. He's one of the Zero Draft 30 members. And so if you go to my blog, um, I have blog posts all this week uh, prepping people for the challenge. And you can see there's a down, you can download this, this wonderful calendar, where, you know, where you can just fill in every day. There's little motivational things in there and whatnot. So. Yeah, and I'm going to link to all that in the show notes, Scott. Um, just, you know, all, all of the things that we've talked about. So, uh, you know, just to sort of, you know, put a period at the end of this whole conversation, Scott, is there anything you wanted to, to sort of add in conclusion? Well, just that, again, reinforcing the point that um, the odds are long, uh, you know, astronomically long to, to be able to make a living as a writer. Um, and yet people do. You know, there it's nice to see that the the number of people in the feature film side of things uh, in Hollywood in 2017, there was an uptick in in the number of people, a uh, pretty substantial one. So there, you know, there, it is possible to work as a writer in the business. But beyond that, just if you pursue your passion, you know, if if you're creative and you don't give voice to that and you don't pursue that, that's such a loss for you and perhaps the universe. Um, and, but if you do pursue it. You know, then you're putting yourself in alignment with some authentic part of yourself. And, you know, again, follow your bliss. It's just, it's more than just three words. It's, it's like a fundamental thing. Can you imagine this world with 8 billion people who are each of them able to pursue the thing about which they were the most passionate, the thing that, uh, enlivened them, uh, you know, what a place this would be. So, I just encourage people to don't think about the odds, don't think about anything other than just what it is that excites you if you're a creative person and pursue it. Whether it's an avocation, whatever it is, you know, woodworking, painting, poetry, kite flying, do that because it's just going to have an incredible benefit for you. And you'll know. At the end of your life, you know, you, you won't say, ah, I regret not doing that. You will have done it. And, and so follow your bliss, as I always, always say. It's, uh, it's profoundly important to uh, insight into life. Yeah, it's, it's – uh, you don't want to live life with regret or, or you know, where you kind of look back and say, why didn't I do that uh, or, or what went wrong? You know, why didn't I – why wasn't I able to do that then, you know? And, uh, you know, uh, I agree completely, Scott, and uh, I think that's a great way to, to sort of put a period at the end of all this. Uh, where can people find you out online, Scott? Well, there's my blog, Go Into the Story. It, uh, you know, that's based on a, a – uh, a, a little anecdote I had with my youngest son. He was about three at the time, and I was joking with him while I was overseeing his bath. I said, well, you know, my dad, your dad's going to write a story tomorrow, a new script, and do you have any advice for me? And he looked up at me and without hesitation said, go into the story and find the animals, which I just thought was, you know, great. And so that's my blog, Go Into the Story. It's now 10 years old. It launched in uh, May 16, 2008. It's the official screenwriting blog of The Blacklist. There are 24,000 posts there. It covers basically everything you could possibly imagine. You can follow me on Twitter, Go Into the Story, at Go Into the Story. Um, I think I have 51,000 followers at this point, but uh, a very active feed there, uh, all screenwriting and writing and creative uh, you know, uh, oriented. Uh, also there's the zero draft 30 Facebook group, which I started back in November of 2015 and, uh, terrific community of people there. And then, uh, the DePaul university school of cinematic arts. If you know anybody, Oh, I should, I have to say this Dave. I got to tell you this. We just recently, uh, you know, uh, starting classes here in September 6th will be the first BFA and MFA uh, set of students for comedy 
writing and film writing in conjunction with the Second City. We've partnered with the Second City, which is the premier improv group. Uh, you know, it's been around for 50 years. And so DePaul University has partnered with the Second City, and we're now offering the world's only, to my knowledge, BFA and MFA programs in comedy writing and filmmaking. So the students get to actually go to the Second City uh, site there and work with those incredible faculty that they have uh, who are just phenomenal teachers when it comes to comedy and and, uh, and, and improv. They actually work with them at the Lincoln uh, Park uh, facility over there. I, I live five blocks from there. Um, and then they also work here at our DePaul University taking classes. So they're getting, they're getting an education, but they're getting an education in which they're going to end up with a portfolio of content and an incredible experience uh, developing their comedy chops from just like top tier faculty in both in worlds, the improv and sketch world, and then the screenwriting and, and writing world. So, so DePaul university school of cinematic arts, uh, is where I am. And, uh, I think that's probably pretty much about it in terms of how you get in touch with me. Oh, can I mention, mention one other thing? Uh, if you, if you're in the UK and you're listening to this, I'm going to be at the London screenwriters festival from, uh, September 7th through the 10th, I believe it is, or 7th through the 9th, 6th through the 9th. Uh, then I'm going to be in, the, in Cologne at the uh, first week of October to Cologne, Germany for a two-day master class. And then I'm doing a keynote address for their film festival. And then I'll be at the Austin Film Festival at the end of October. And then if you're in France, I'm going to be in Paris in March of 2019 for a three-day uh, workshop there too. So uh, doing a lot more of this type of thing. So uh, I will definitely link that in the show notes. And because Scott, I think uh, I think the UK is like the third uh, biggest listener base of this podcast. So uh, all right. So uh, we'll, uh, I think that's a it's a good sign. So, um, but you know, Scott, I'm gonna link to everything you said in the show notes. Everybody, it's at DaveBullis dot com. Twitter, it's at DB Podcast. Scott, I want to say thank you so much for coming on. Well, great, and uh, everybody, you should definitely bookmark Dave's podcast. It's a great one. He's been doing this religiously uh, for, for many years now. And uh, great having a conversation with you again, Dave. I hope you enjoyed going inside the mind of Scott Meyer. If you want to get links to anything we spoke about in this episode, head over to the show notes at bulletproofscreenwriting.tv forward slash ISM 011. And if you like the show, please subscribe and leave us a review on Apple, Spotify, Stitcher, Spreaker, wherever you listen to the show, head over to screenwritersmind.com. Thank you for listening. And as always, write, rewrite, sell, repeat. I'll talk to you next week. Thank you for listening to Inside the Screenwriter's Mind with Alex Ferrari at screenwritersmind.com. And for more great filmmaking and screenwriting podcasts, go to ifhpodcastnetwork.com.